Mr. Nick Sharo Lambus, welcome back. Thanks very much, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. Our last episode went down really, really well. And one of the main reasons I feel it went down well is a lot of the people who listen to this podcast would be similar enough to us in terms of they are business owners or they have an interest in running their own projects. And all of that is inextricably linked with money and finances and planning. And they took a lot of value from what you um, brought to the table the last time. And I know since a lot of people have come down and have engaged your services and are working with you as well, which is for me, is, is it's amazing because this is what we're trying to do here is obviously empower people to, to make decisions and give them the information they need to grow. This episode in particular, we're going to focus on business owners. And I think small to medium business owners realistically in, in Ireland, um, which is, as I said, a large part of the demographic of people who listen to this podcast. And that's not to exclude if someone's listening now who might not run a business. This is still really interesting, good information to know because you, you understand how small businesses in Ireland actually work. And it's not what it looks like from the outside. And I think you're going to test that as well as a business owner. Uh, absolutely, Dan. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, okay, so well, let's just dive straight into this. There's a couple of topics. I know the hot topic at the moment is auto enrollment. So... Auto, okay, let, let me phrase this question in a specific way. Auto enrollment is obviously relating to pensions. Immediately, everybody's going, oh, here we go, pensions again. But what I'm going to ask you to do, Nick, if you don't mind, is I did not know. I knew what a pension was. I knew what the word pension meant, but I didn't really understand, like, w what is a pension? How does this affect me? Why do I have to care about it? Why is it something I should take an active interest in? Maybe let's start, would you mind giving us a breakdown of, like, what what is a pension? Why should we be interested in it? And then we can move into auto enrollment and what that means now for business owners moving forward. So I, I when I speak to clients, I talk about, you know, three, I break it up into compartments. So I talk about short term, medium term, long term. Short term tends to be zero to three years. Medium term is your three to, let's call it your financial independence time. For me, it's 63 years of age and I'll explain why as we go through this. But what I'm really saying is for a pension, and there's a lot of jargon in the industry, but it's really a long-term savings plan that helps you to not have to work, or certainly not to the same degree. We talk about this phased approach to retiring where what's happening now is that people are starting to kind of pull back as they get into their maybe late 40s or late 50s, depending on what, what situation. So when you hear the word pension, just think about the later period where you want to be able to like take life easier. And the, the pension itself, and there's different types of pensions. Don't worry about the phraseology. Again, we get bogged down by details. If you can put money away for the future and get the tax man to help you, that's what a pension's about. And really where auto enrollment kicks in, and look, we're, talk, we're doing this in 2024, um, the government has stated very clearly that it will happen this year. They haven't been specific about the date. We're going to find that out probably in February, maybe March. It looks like it's going to be the 1st of September. And what I'm suggesting to business owners, and even for anybody in Ireland who's employed, is you should really just be aware of what it is and how it might impact on you. And by the way, I should start by saying I'm not a fan of anyone being auto-enrolled into a pension scheme, which may sound surprising because we're talking about this as a positive. Mm. So... Let's talk about it from the business owner's perspective. And it could be that you have one employee. So however small you might feel you are, and it, it doesn't typically include the individual. So it doesn't include Dan and Nick per se, but it includes somebody that you employ. Um, and not, not contractors, by the way. I spoke to uh, someone the other day who has 15 people contracting into him and he doesn't have a responsibility for them uh, in terms of pensions, which seems a bit unfair, but that's the, the, the regime at the moment. But he did have two employees. And what I said to him is that if he doesn't do anything until the 1st of September, he's going to receive communication that those two employees are going to be mandated into the pension. There'll be one and a half percent of their salaries deducted. And he will have to pay as the employer one and a half percent of their salaries into a pension scheme to the state. There's no flexibility. There's no choice. It's just taken from the company's bank account. And there are severe penalties if they don't abide by that. So it, this is fairly, fairly serious. And you might say, Nick, well, why is that a bad thing? Like the advantages surely are that the business owner can attract more staff because they can now receive a pension. It's, it's a bonus if you think about it from the employee's point of view. Mm. They're getting one and a half percent of an extra payment, which is not bad. You know, if you're on 40,000 a year, let's say that's 600 quid in that year that you'll be better off by. Okay, you won't physically get it now, but we talked earlier about long-term, it's for the future and it grows tax-free, which is a big advantage of pensions. 
Um, what I'm saying to these business owners, so if you employ one person or if you're that employee that works for somebody, I'd prefer if I had the ability to pay at my own discretion to the pension, not be mandated by the state where it's one and a half percent this year and then three years time, it's going to be three percent and then six years time, four and a half. And then it finishes in nine years from now at six percent. Which is pretty chunky. Which is chunky for a business owner that is you know, employing one or more people, 6% of the salary. And by the way, the employee has to match you. And the employee may not like that. Imagine employing somebody nine years from now as a business owner, 23 years of age, that's the entry day, and you have to put 6% of their salary into a pension scheme. And they do as well. Mm. They're not going to be very happy with that. So the, it's all about solutions. And, you know, we talk about, you know, what can you do? You know, there's no point talking about the problem. And what I'm saying to business owners, you need to be a little bit proactive. And you should start as soon as possible. Again, we spoke earlier, Dan, off record about, you know, what can you do to be financially successful? Can you retire early? And I spoke earlier, you know, about ad adapting to the situation. So as a business owner myself, what I'm looking at is saying, well, okay, I need to plan ahead for it because it's, it's a cost. And what are the opportunities for me? Well, if you put a pension scheme in place, even for one employee, you can direct what contribution levels go in. You can decide whether you want the employee to pay into the scheme or not. You can choose the provider and more importantly, you can get advice. There's loads of advantages. One of the main advantages of not being auto-enrolled is that the employee can draw the benefits from the pension scheme from the age of 50 onwards, Okay, which suits a lot of people. I'm not suggesting that they will retire at 50, but it's nice to know um, that if you left that company at 50 or even before, and you built up a pension fund of 10, 20, 50,000 euros, whatever the figure was, that you would have access to at least a quarter of it, maybe all of it from that age onwards. And then it helps you in terms of, again, deciding how best to use those funds, whether it be for paying down debt or helping kids through college. Mm. It's, a, it's a big advantage, in my opinion. Absolutely. And um, before we go deeper into auto enrollment, can I ask you, and this might seem fairly basic to some people, but I know myself included, like sometimes it's the basic stuff we're afraid to ask. And so we never actually find out. Pensions, you mentioned that the government um, can match oftentimes what you put into your pension. Why do they do that? And what exactly does that look like? So the, the, the main benefits of a pension scheme, just to strip it down, is that if, let's say, you know, Nick has an employee and the employee has a pension scheme, they can decide to put a contribution into that scheme. And let's say it's 100 euros a month from their salary. And it's taken at source, so it's very easy for them. They don't have to do anything, you know, um, and the employer sets it up. The government will give them a rebate of the tax that they pay. And if they're earning over 42,000 a year in Ireland from January 2024, they will get 40% from the, back from the government. So it costs them 60 euros which is a 66% increase. Don't mind the 40% deduction. Yeah. If you do the math, 60 euros times 1.66 is 100 euros. It's a massive boost to any savings account. And again, just remember, pensions are just long-term savings. The reason the government do that, and if, I'm sorry, if you're earning less than 42,000 a year, you get 20% back. So that's a 33% boost. Um, is that we have a, a, a pension problem in Ireland, as most countries do around the world, that... We have this aging population. The pension has been increased. The pension age from 65 to 66, it may be increased further. Um, it's funded out of PSI contributions. So I always believe that there's going to be a state pension. People think that maybe it'll be removed from us. I, I don't believe that myself. But it only pays about 13,500 euros a year, which is not something that most people can afford to live on. And hence why you should have a private pension, a separate pension to the state pension. There's only really two types of pensions. There's a state pension, the one that you will qualify for if you have worked for um, about 33 years uh, or above, or there's your private pension, which is in addition to that. And it doesn't affect your ability to draw the state pension. You okay. really want both of them to run beside each other. So from a government perspective, we're trying to incentivize people to save to be able to support themselves. We Absolutely. have an issue. Uh, with private pensions, again, I don't want to get bogged down in the detail here, but again, it's just interesting to understand this. It is, that money is being used as well to potentially earn more money, not necessarily for you, but it is, it's, 
a lot of people would ask why, what, what, where's the benefit or where's the gain for these private companies, these private pensions to, to just to save your money for you um, and you're benefiting at the end of the day, but they're actually using this money to invest and to grow. Is that correct? It is. And, you know, when I, when I speak to people about, you know, putting money into a pension scheme, um, the main things they can do, there's only really two options, like choices for the individual. Number one is how much can they afford? Like what is realistic? And people often ask me, like, how much of my salary should be going to the pension? And I say realistically a minimum of 5%. And typically, if you can afford it, 10% of your salary. Now that may seem like a lot to some people, but again, we must remember it's deducted by at least 20% and typically 40% for most of us. You know, the average wage in Ireland is above 42,000. So let's say you're earning 50,000 a year. That would equate to 5,000 euros, which is 416 a month. But with a 40% deducted, it costs you 250 euros mm. a month. That in itself isn't a huge amount that will give you a really decent lifestyle in retirement. And that could be from 55 onwards. Yeah. And again, we talk about this phased approach to retiring. So it's about the ability to draw different pensions down. Okay. Um, so that's a really big thing. But the fact is, the other decision that the individual must make is, okay, where does that money go? That 5 or 10% of your salary. Um, and I say to people, well, on a scale of 1 to 7, in terms of risk and reward, one being very low risk, very little return, seven being very high risk, very high return. Depending on what time frame you have left, you should be higher up the scale. I often don't ask clients like what their risk tolerance is to pensions, which might surprise you because as financial advisors, we need to know our clients and understand what they can tolerate. And it's not that I force them into, you know, investing where they may not feel comfortable. But the point being is that the longer the time they have, the more they can potentially make gains and suffer those short-term losses. Okay. And I know it sounds a bit left field, but if you think about it, if you've got 20 years before you're going to be able to draw this money down, let's say you're 30 and the earliest age you can draw a pension is 50 years of age. And you were in a fund that was like able to grow by 8 to 10% a year, but in any given year could fall by 8 to 10% a year. Would it really bother you if in the first couple of years it fell, knowing that you have another 18 years for it to recuperate? And in general, and again, the, 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 the figures show this, it is always the case that these investments grow much more over that five, 10 year period. And that's why I encourage people to you know, take advantage of that. And obviously then you can de-risk as you get older, closer towards when you're gonna draw the money. Okay. Okay. So just from my simple mind to, to, to paint a picture here of the, the pension, you could pay yourself or not, not pay into a pension and take that hundred euro and put it in your bank account where it's not going to earn any money and potentially just spend it on something else. And unless you're a very savvy investor, it's not actually going to give you any leverage later in your life. Or you could invest in a pension and make more and initially make an initial saving because obviously you get tax relief on it um, or the government matches it or whatever way you want to look at it. And then you have the option to maybe be a bit more speculative with the investment of that money in terms of making a return on that money. So it's a safer savings plan because the money's not sitting in your bank account or your pocket where you're probably going to spend it. It's initially cost you less to invest in this than it would to actually take the money because you're not getting that break. And then obviously 20 years down the road, rather than you having to have rely on yourself to save 100 euro a month in your bank account and not touch it and be, it's in a pension plan, which potentially has a lot more growth than you would have sitting in the bank. Absolutely. And th the other main aspect, Dan, and you've said it exactly correct, is that in the pension scheme, the taxman doesn't touch the growth for all of the years. So say, for example, that 30 year old, for those 20 years that the investment grows by, and that compounding effect is enormous. Like Einstein speaks about, you know, the most powerful universe uh, on the planet is compound interest. Um, if you try and do it outside of the pension, so you're right, some people may feel that they prefer the control and have the money in the bank and they'll do their own thing and invest it. The tax man is going to take some of the growth. Mm. And that's the big problem because obviously the fact that you can kick the can down the road when it comes to the tax man. And some people say that pensions are just a deferred form of tax. You know, you pay tax at the end. And I say to them, but so you've got this 40% tax relief in the main on the contributions you make. You've got that kickstart. The money has grown tax-free for all of those intervening years. And at the end, you can take at least a quarter of the fund tax-free 
and of the three quarters that remain, it still continues to grow tax-free, but when you draw it, it's seen as income. And generally speaking, for most of us, it'd be drawn at the lower tax rate. So you are getting a turn on that as okay. well. There's so many advantages of pensions, but they're just misunderstood. And they're, in essence, they're, they're, they're oversold by my industry because it's pensions, pensions, pensions without really understanding the benefit. It's not a tangible product. That's the problem. People look at houses and they, they see, you know, value. I have a lot of clients who they feel that their property is their pension. You know, and that was always the mm. adage that was given to me. I'm not knocking property as an investment, um, but you can have the best of both worlds because potentially if you build up your pension scheme big enough, you can buy a property in the pension scheme. Not for everyone, but it's an opportunity to, to understand. And you might think, well, how is that better than owning it outright myself? And um, the, the thing I'd say to people is, well, yeah, but the, the rental income that you get is not taxed. Imagine you getting 1,500 euros a month off a two-bed apartment house in... There's two-bed apartments. <laughs> not in Dublin. There's not, <laughs> not in Dublin. I lived out in Cork, but... Um, <laughs> not even in Cork anymore. Not in Cork, think, no. Yeah. But um, the taxman's going to take 52% of it from you mm. if you earn it outright. Whereas if it goes into your pension scheme, the taxman doesn't have any right to that um, rental income. And obviously, if the property goes up in value, same thing. You don't pay capital gains tax. So it's it's worth knowing the opportunities. And then, again, as part of your overall financial picture, pensions are not always the be-all and end-all for everything. I start on this, what I call a menu board. And for most business owners, I think it is really up there. But of course, if you've got shorter-term you know, objectives, and this is where you have to start out with your financial plan, you know, if you've got to get kids through college, and your kids are, you know, in their teens and your pension fund isn't able to be accessed and for 10, 15 years, there's no point you putting all your money into a mm. pension. So it is about finding the right balance. And I talk about these dials, you just turn them up or down. And it goes back to what we said at the start. But the one key takeaway, in my opinion, from today is review regularly. Um, or ours there, um, in that you need to check in at least once a year and find out what has changed. The pensions industry, by the way, um, has changed immensely, particularly for business owners, in the last 13 months. In January 2023, the government made this massive change in allowing limited company business owners to invest as much money as they wish from their business into a pension scheme. So you imagine this small to medium-sized business that has a very good year or starts to see more and more money in their bank account. And it may only be on an occasion. And, you know, again, I talk to people about make hay while you can. And instead of you paying 12.5% corporation tax on that profit of, say, 100,000 that year, you could write a check for 100,000 euros. It goes straight into a pension with all the advantages we spoke about. And it reduces your tax, your corporation tax by the 12,500 euros. And you've got that now in your name, ring fenced, and nobody can take that away from you. And you get that growth, obviously. It's, it's huge. And, and, and so many business owners, and we'll talk about tax, obviously, later on, but I think it's a huge opportunity, you know, for any limited business owners that are out there, paying tax in your company, particularly in the early years, I think, and I say this respectfully as a business owner of 10 years, it's a bit of vanity. You don't need to make a profit, you know, truly. And you need to think certainly before your year end comes, because you have to do it in the year of question. And some business owners say, well, I don't know what my profit will be. And I say, well, you need to have a conversation with your accountant and have a sense about, you know, are you likely to make a profit? Is there money in the company that will afford you the opportunity? The only drawback of the pension is you cannot access the funds once mm. you pay it across. But for most business owners out there, they probably know that there's monies that they can put towards their future. And it's the best place for it. In, in the main. Yeah, this, Nick, is why I feel that this conversation is so important for particularly small to medium business owners because in the bigger companies, there's entire departments dedicated to how do we pay as little tax as possible. Exactly. <laughs> uh, like me, t talking about myself personally, like small business started from grassroots, ground up, no business experience whatsoever. And you're doing the thing to do the thing. So you start a business to do the thing that you love doing. If it's a cafe, you want to make coffee. If it's yeah. if it's a tire shop, you, you, want, you want to fit tires. And this stuff is almost like Chinese and it, you're, you're allergic to it. You want, you want to pay the accountant and you want him to take care of everything. But most accountants, no disrespect to accountants, they're not financial advisors. 
they're accountants. They're there to do the books and submit su- submit your, your financial reports. They're not there necessarily to advise you on tax law and efficiency within your business. And they're looking at credit and debit and telling you, right, okay, you need to have a better month and maybe you need to run less expenses next month or wh- whatever it might be. But their job is not to advise you from a financial perspective, which I didn't understand for a long time. Mm-hmm. So it, understanding how to be more efficient with the money that's in your business is massive because what in my experience now talking to a lot of smaller business owners when there's more money in the company what do you do you pay yourself a bit more so you give more of that money to the tax man and it's really inefficient and then that that golden year might not be so golden next year and we've all experienced those quiet weeks months years whatever it might be so having a long-term strategy and understanding well okay on being really efficient with every euro, because you know how hard it is to earn a euro in a business. It's hard when you have to do all of the bits yourself. Every one of those euros on being as efficient as possible. So it's more than I've made X amount of money and I've paid myself Y. It's the business has now generated a, a pension plan for me, which is really tax efficient. And as you spoke, but we we'll, we'll speak about other areas that can be more tax efficient in the business later on. But I, th- I think it's vital for people like us to understand. It is. And again, I think it's really good to, to have a relationship with your accountant that you have an understanding of where the business is, but generally speaking, the accountants look backwards and financial advisors look mm, forward. Okay, that's a good distinction. So that's the way I, I would kind of probably reference that. Okay, that's a very good distinction. Just just to, to, to finish out this conversation on pensions, um, we, we touched on auto enrollment there. So now that we have an understanding of what a pension is, maybe now we can understand that there is such a thing as a good pension and maybe a not so good pension. And auto enrollment, while it does kind of capture the people outside the net who have no pension, which is a positive thing. You've outlined some of the the negatives there, but th- th- there is such a thing as making a good decision and the freedom is taken away from you really, but I don't know. Is that kind of what we're saying here? Around? Absolutely, Dan. Yeah. Okay. 100%. And the, the thing is, you're right. You can't say that having a pension is, is a good thing. So I come across, you know, those small business owners that may have had a pension scheme previously and just say, well, I'm just going to add to that pension scheme. And in some cases, it's not possible if they had a pension, say, working for a company before, you can't do that, you know, or if they were self-employed, like I'm conscious some of the business owners listen today, they may not have incorporated a business. They may be self-employed, mm. you know, and a lot of people say they're self-employed, but they have a limited company. But if you've just started out, you probably haven't set up a company yet. Now, it's not a difficult thing to do. And again, a good accountant would advise you about the the pros and cons of that. But the same things really apply. Like for a self-employed person that, you know, has just set up and is working for themselves and um, they still need, if they have an employee, to pay into a pension for them. So it's not that they're off the hook. Um, The self-employed person, again, albeit that they don't have a separate structure. It's funny, when I talk to business owners, I say that they have three different hats and it often surprises them. And I say, well, what do you mean? Well, I see, you know, Dan as an individual. And then I see Dan's company as a separate entity. It's a different hat and you need to look at it differently. Even though Dan may feel he, he is the company and it's one and the same, it's very, very different, certainly from a financial planning perspective. And then there's Dan's pension, which is the third hat. And I know that may seem odd, but the pension is outright. It's one of the biggest assets you'll ever grow in your lifetime, truly speaking, it, it is. And we'll talk about tax Tax is one of the biggest expenses that you're going to incur in your life. Mm-hmm. So just think about it that way. Yeah. Pension, asset, uh, tax is one of the biggest expenses. I, I like how you've explained that as well, because that was explained to me early on when I was originally self-employed. I have a, a limited company now, and it was dr- it was actually my dad who drilled this down my neck. He's like, you are not the company. The company is a separate Something. thing and has its own requirements, and it, it, it's not you. You really need to understand this from, from a legal point of view, from a tax point of view, from a planning point of view, from a financial point of view. It's not you. And for the longest time, I struggled because I was like, it is, it's only me in this room. It's like, but it's a different entity. It exists as its own thing. Totally. And just sorry, I, I got off point slightly, but in terms of pensions, the one thing I would say to the listeners is make sure that your pension scheme is at the lowest cost that it should be. And I know you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Pensions are like any product. You know, it's like buying a piece of furniture. You need to ensure that you're not spending more than you you would normally. You know, you wouldn't pay three euros for a can of Coke or maybe somewhere you would. But, you're in Dublin. Yeah, in Dublin. <laughs> but like, you know, if you know that it costs two euros mm-hmm. next door and it's the same thing for a pension. And if you think about it, the, the real difference is over those 10, 15, 20 years, it is thousands upon thousands of wasted euros. Mm. You know, we always say this as a starting point. If you say, well, okay, but how do you really know about fees and charges? 
I say to everybody, you should be getting 100% of your money that you put into the pension scheme invested. It's a really good ready reckoner for everyone out there. Just check with your pension scheme. And if you don't know, you kind of should. You know, I say this to people, like you can't work hard in your business and then let these other things that are around you just go by the wayside. And we tend to be like that. We're, we're time poor when it comes to our own affairs. Mm -hmm. And I say this to business owners, you need to kind of know. I, I often ask business owners, uh, where is your pension fund? Which provider is it with? And they actually don't know. And I get a little bit kind of worried because then I know that they don't want, they won't know the fees and charges. They won't know the funds. And these are the things that, you know, I look for. And the key thing is then it's not about you being the expert. I don't expect a business owner that is running a tire business or is running, you know, that flower shop to understand that they don't have the time. It's not their skill set. So, you know, you'd expect that a financial planner would get in and have a look under the bonnet and say, okay, this is what you have. And this is the starting point really for, for everyone. And sometimes it's good to have an independent viewpoint. You know, I say to people, you know, don't work with tight agents. And what I mean by that is that like, if you deal with AIB, you're really dealing with Irish life. They're tied to Irish life. It's really unfortunate, you know, that they, they have that affiliation. And you don't get the ability then to look at other providers. You don't get the ability to find out what the, the variance is in fees, you know. So our industry has moved a long way, but it's still important for the consumer to just be a little bit savvy when it comes to asking the poignant questions. And if anyone wants any guidance, again, you know, feel free to reach out to me. But it's about knowing, like, what, what are my fees and charges? You know, is there anything hidden? Is the funds in the right risk category to start with? You know, there's no point Dan having his funds in a low risk fund when he's got 10, 20 years before he's drawing it down. It, you know, it, it's madness because it's a guarantee to lose money. Yeah. Even though, ironically, it's like, you, that's why it might be there because, you know, mentally it might feel, well, that's safe. But inflation is going to be your enemy in that instance. Mm. And, you know, I talk to business owners about even shorter term and not to jump topic, but same principle, you know, if you've got money in your business, what is it doing for you? Is it working as hard as it should be? Um, and inflation has been, and it continues to be a problem in Ireland. You know, it's, it's been much worse as we know. Thankfully, things seem to have somewhat stabilized. But if your money's not making 3%, it doesn't matter whether it's in a pension or in a deposit account, then you're losing year on year. And that's that's a problem for, for business owners for sure. A visual I often think of with this stuff is like a leaky bucket and you're working so hard to fill the bucket up. You you don't notice the leaks, but it's just slowly draining away all it's your really hard work way, and effort. It? Yeah, and I, I, I feel that as a, as a business owner as well because you, you said it earlier on, you're so focused on doing the thing. You're so motivated and driven. You're working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks and you're thinking about a million different things and this customer and, and that marketing and your website and all your different bits and bobs to fill this bucket up. It's just so inefficient if you're not patching up those leaks. And the patching of the leaks, sometimes listening to to, to yourself or to people speaking, I'm sitting here going, there's, there's a million different things I need to think about here that are completely outside the realm of what I'm already doing. I don't know how I can bring this in. But as you mentioned, it, it is a symbol. It's just, you, you don't have to be the expert. You can speak to the experts and they can advise you and help you. And I found that a really good expert will empower you as well. Like what you're doing here, they'll explain it to you. They won't gatekeep the information. And um, obviously th things like tied agents and things like that, there, there's a pathway that's predefined there to a certain degree. So you don't have as much control or options as you like. But simply being able to step back, listen to podcasts like this, step back, speak to somebody, have conversations. All of a sudden you realize, oh, I, I can make some very simple decisions here that are going to, it could be the diff, it could be literally could be the difference between success in your business and not success in your business. Because how, how long, how many years can you do 80 hour weeks in your business? Not not too many years. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not, a, it's not a long term plan to just keep filling the bucket up faster than it's leaking. Yeah. I'm going to patch the leaks. Totally. I mentioned earlier about this uh, fire movement, yeah. um, this, you know. Um, and it's interesting because it, it's gained in pace. And I think a lot of people are, you know, maybe more inclined to look at social media. Um, they, you know, the number of times I've been asked about um, looking at these tracker funds, you know, they, they call them ETFs or exchange chain funds. Again, lots of jargon on industry, but they, they hear about Vanguard and, you know, this S&P 500. Yeah. And I get clients telling me where I should invest their pension money. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is really, you know, gone a step too far. And the unfortunate thing is that, look, it's not that it's a bad thing. And I think there's a lot more education out there for us. It's just a one fits all solution is not the solution. You know, it doesn't solve yeah. all. And you do need to get proper advice. And, and look, whoever you talk to, 
just make sure that, again, it would be better, in my opinion, if they were independent, but that you need to make sure that you're checking in. The biggest problem, I think, for most business owners is, as you said, Dan, they get a really focused on their business, which I totally understand. I've been in that position. Absolutely. My business has had really good years and it's had some really bad years where I haven't paid into a pension. And you might say, Nick, well, you're a hypocrite. It has to be what is right for the business at the time. You know, yeah. uh, funny enough, my business, you know, we, we were renting a, a unit um, down in Cork and I was building up monies in the, in the business to pay for, you know, a, a new unit. So I, I was suffering tax, which was inextricable for a financial planner to see, but it was deliberate for that reason. And obviously once that hurdle was, was achieved, then you kind of look and focus on the next one. And that's the, the ability of turning up this tap and turning it down. Mm. And then at times maybe turning it off, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's, no, I, I really like that approach. Um, and again, it's there's resistance there for, for anybody listening because it requires reflection. And it's funny, I say this a lot in this podcast, the crossovers with all the different conversations I have. This is financial planning. I think I said this to the last time as well. Financial planning and pension and taxes. And I spoke to someone recently about um, breath work and meditation and someone else about nutrition and health. And a lot of it is comes back to have a plan and a direction and regularly reassess that plan because you are, go you are going to change or the environment is going to change or something is going to change. And unless you have your finger on the pulse, you're blindly heading down this alleyway. And you might get lucky, but the chances are you're going to be unlucky. Um, and when it comes to your money and planning and business and finance, I think the consequences are very severe if you close your eyes and just plow ahead. Or you, you, you decide to be ignorant to it all because it's all a little bit scary. Which, and it is. Look, if we're not in this industry, a, a lot of this sounds intimidating because we don't understand financial terms and planning and tax and pensions and stuff like that. But uh, Absolutely, Dan. And the thing is, you know, it's been a challenging few years for, for most business owners out there. Obviously, for those that were working, you know, pre-COVID and then obviously COVID has had maybe sometimes a positive impact, but definitely has impacted on all of us. And then we've had this, you know, real hike in interest rates, which, again, may not have had as much of an effect on the business. It has affected a lot of businesses. But in our personal life, and I talk about these different hats, anybody that had a mortgage, they've had to suffer. So, Therefore, you may have had to increase your salary from the company just to pay for something that has changed in your personal life. Yeah. And again, we're back to these kind of dials. And um, but we, again, we mentioned off record about you know business owners, and particularly if you know, hopefully, as the business starts to get more successful, you know, and, and time generally does help. You know, hopefully, you feel that if you're going in the right direction, and you know, you're putting in the hours, um, and you know, you make those tough decisions. Um, how do you reward yourself? And for most of us, it's salary. Yeah. You know, we just take more and more of a salary. And I say to every business owner, the sweet spot for all of us, particularly when you set up the limited company, is to pay yourself that 42000 a year. And anything above that, the tax man gets very interested. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's the 51, 52%. Yeah. And I've never achieved that, by the way. So again, I'm not here to sort of preach the gospel. I, I say to people, just an, an understanding. And if you said, Nick, well, okay, and let's say you have a partner who maybe isn't working or isn't working maybe part-time in the business. Obviously, they can be paid. And then you've got kids who are of an age. And what I mean by that is that typically from the age of 14 onwards, depending on the type of business you have, they can come in. Like my son, he's 18 now. He just started in college in Cork. But, you know, as a 14-year-old, he came into the office and did a little bit of, you know, licking stamps and you know uh making coffees making and, coffees yeah and you know as long as it's a justifiable expense they can receive up to twelve thousand a year tax free and it's about just thinking about okay the best way of extracting money out of your business we spoke about pensions earlier but there are other forms of expenses insurances for example yeah. you know it's, it's not a, a exciting topic you know but if you think about it what else can the business owner you know um do for themselves and in my opinion, one of the main advantages of a limited company is that they, the company can pay totally legitimately for um, protecting your, yourself and your family. Protecting yourself, how? Providing cover if you're out of work, sick, or have a, an injury or illness. You know, and again, for most business owners, that's probably one of the primary things that I feel is important. Yeah. Now, if you're only paying yourself 42000 a year, your ability to cover that is quite small because obviously you can't insure yourself for a hundred thousand protection if you're only drawing that even though the business may be 
generating more than the money that you draw. But again, it's just about boxing clever and thinking to yourself, okay, well, you know, if I can only ensure what I'm drawing as a salary from the business, what other things can I do then and use the business for? Yeah. For example, you know, again, it's a little bit morbid, but pr providing in the event of if you pass early, so while you're working in the business, and the advantages are the business pays for it, it goes directly to your dependents tax-free, and there's no benefit in kind. Huge advantage, but a lot of business owners don't even know that that exists. And you might think, well, what's the significance of that? Well, if you've got dependents, it's significant. But also, if you're paying for these policies personally, wouldn't it be better, better to put them into business? So for any people listening that has set up a company in the last couple of years, it was so important because that second hat was created. And obviously the third hat, potentially the pension hat, or the opportunity to use them, and you probably haven't realized. Yeah. I have a lot of business owners that are still paying into policies personally, pensions and these protection policies, and it's a complete waste of their money. Genuinely, it really is. And they maybe it just haven't had the opportunity to check in with somebody or just haven't got the advice, you know. Um, yeah. So to my mind, that's a really important aspect of, you know, I look at it as a balance sheet. And if as an individual, you can keep your expenses low and utilize the other entity, which is the company, it's obviously going to help you in terms of your financial wellment. Uh, particularly for the future. I mentioned this to you on our call recently. Uh, when I um, started my business, and we're only a few years in business, when I started my business, a good friend of mine who was a very experienced businessman, uh, he explained this concept to me that you've just kind of run through there. You would think, and anyone who doesn't run a business who's listened to this, maybe this is the impression you have. And as you've pointed out, many people who do run a business, this is still the impression that you start your business and your business earns a hundred euro and you pay yourself as much of that hundred euro as possible and what goes in your pocket and that's business and that's how it works. But what this man explained to me was the real success in business is being able to leverage the entity to support your life. In And this is not, because some people hear this and they go, this sounds very dodgy. This is this is not dodgy at all. This is how the system works. And I, in my opinion, how successful business owners manage to live successful lives with the stress of running a business. Because as you pointed out, there are many areas of your personal expenses that can be supplemented or supported by your business. And um, because you are the business owner, you, you need that support. If you don't take that support and all you're doing, like for example, paying a, a private insurance policy with money that you've taken and has already been taxed from the company, it, it's it's another massive hole in that leaky bucket that you're po just literally just pouring money away when you don't need to. And it's not that you're trying to cheat the system. Because this is something, it's regularly, Nick, when I, when I try and talk about this concept with friends of mine who are business owners and friends who aren't, it sounds like you're trying to cheat the system, but it, this is the system. This is how the system works. And if you don't understand it, you're at a disadvantage. Uh, absolutely, Dan. And the thing is, it's just, you know, it's just lack of knowledge, really. Yeah. Um, and as I said, as business owners, you know, we, we've taken risks. You know, it is. And there, there are things that the government would allow us. So as hard as it can be, you know, you've got to, you know, justify your, your pay every month and, you are the, the, the gatekeeper, really, yeah. to, to your success. Um, the, the next stage, and again, I know for some people who have just started businesses, it's probably the last thing on their minds about the exit mechanism. Like we've touched on pensions, but they're not the only tool in the, the toolbox. Um, I you know Some business owners may have come across something called, now again, there's a lot of jargon, but uh, another vehicle to take money out of your company it's called retirement relief. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what that is. It's not a retirement, like as in a pension scheme. But if somebody has set up a company and is an employee of that company from the age of 45 for 10 years following that, from the age of 55 onwards, they can extract up 750,000 tax-free from their mm -hmm. company. And people often say to me, oh yeah, Nick, I heard about this. I spoke to my accountant and they told me that I can just take money out of my company. So I'm going to leave the money in there. And I say to them, okay, but that's a, co a, a government scheme, which could be closed down tomorrow. Yeah. And it's very risky to rely solely on that strategy. I'm not against it. I'm absolutely for it. I, I am aiming for that myself, by the way. So again, I can hopefully explain to people as a fellow business owner, the pros and cons of, you know, each of these decisions. Um, but I see it as a complement to the traditional pension scheme. 
But so, it's, so to cut across, Nick, just just to clarify the thought process there for people who might not understand, ra- rather than taking the money out now and paying your contributions and tax on it now, yeah. leave it in the company where it's going to be taxed significantly less and have an extraction strategy for it based on this exactly based on this scheme yeah. in 10 years time or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. So the relevance is, let's say if you were 40, you'd say, Nick, okay, what's the point of me knowing this? You know, you've said that it only really applies if you're 45. Yeah. So the significance is that you may then take a slightly different track and say, okay, I can boost my pension scheme for the next five years. Yes. And when I reach 45, I now know that there's another vehicle in play that I can maybe utilize. And you build it up slowly. And then the other thing then is to say, okay, Nick, well, I get it. So I might start just saving money in my company. And then it comes down to, okay, where is it going to be saved? Because you're not going to leave it just it's sitting and dormant in your yeah. business current account earning zero point. Zero one percent. <laughs> you're going to want to utilize it, and it's about knowing what the right tool is. Okay, uh, it is. It's really like I find this area really interesting. It's funny. Some people, it's like double dutch to them. It's kind of like me and and medical. My, my wife, uh, she has a kind of a medical kind of background, and uh, we we watch some of these shows on on Netflix, and I get kind of the jitters when I see anyone with a scalpel or anything. You know, it's just it's completely not my area. But um, you loved when the calculator comes out. Though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. What I'm saying is that it's just to, to understand, like, interestingly, and again, I don't want to totally differentiate business owners, but we are still all, you know, human beings. Like we're, we're regular people mm. that go through the nuances of, like, managing our mortgage to trying to save for our kids' education. And we need to use the company, obviously, because we're not in a situation where we probably were previously well, we had a set wage and we just knew that we had to utilize that. I go back to the basics of, you know, the budget calculator. And, you know, if anyone has listened to the last podcast, they would remember, you just need this once a year process that we do. Um, if you said, Nick, okay, where can we start? What's the best thing that we can do today that's going to make a difference? I'd say download one of these free online budget calculators. There's one on the Alpha Wealth website, but whatever you use, um, there's really good apps that you can use now. Unpost have a really good money manager app where it basically pulls in information from your bank account with you with Revolut, Bank of Ireland, AIB, and it helps you manage your money. Now, I find it a little bit kind of, I wouldn't say intrusive, but it's a, a bit more hands-on, but it might be useful for a month or two just to get people on the right track. And some people, you know, swear by it. Um, but for me, if you complete that budgeter once a year, just, you know, populate it with your income that you're taking from the company and what you're spending your money on. And you'll find that exercise alone. And it only takes a few minutes if you have your online banking app open or months worth of bank statements. And you'll get a fair clear idea about, you know, where your money's going. And it doesn't have to be exact science. Like often people say, Nick, oh, but I complete the budgeter and it says that I should have an extra thousand quid a month, but I don't see it every month. And, it, and it's typical, you know, and, and it's happened so often. And it's not their fault. It's just the fact that it's that leakage. You talk about the leaky mm-hmm. bucket. It's the same in their own, you know, personal world. Why? Because most people generally tend to underestimate certain expenses. Probably grocery tends to be one of them. We don't realize, but, yeah. you know, you might go down to the local shop on a Sunday to get the newspaper and you spend 20 euros because you picked up a few other b- bits. And it's not that it's a bad thing. I don't tell people where to spend. I just say to them, be conscious of it. Yeah. You know, gifts, for example, like we often go to parties or whatever, children's birthday parties, and we give gifts, but we never allow for it in our budgeting. And then we wonder, like, where's the money gone? Yeah. Um, and it's been a tough time. Like, we talk about this cost of living, you know, increase that we've suffered. Um, and I'm cognizant of the fact that, you know, there are people that are going through difficult times. I've struggled as well, you know, at times in my business. Um, and thankfully, you know, you try and kind of battle through that. But you need to sort of tighten, you know, and batten down the hatches. Um, thankfully, you know, as of January 2024, we're all going to see improvements. You know, we're all going to be paying a bit less tax. And I say to people, OK, but what are you going to do with that? Have you, you know, decided what are you going to do? Because what will happen is we'll absorb it into our day-to-day spending. Lifestyle creep. It's yeah. lifestyle creep. So, you know, again, and if that's a conscious decision, that's fine. People say to me, um, you know, again, they, they kind of have this kind of, you know, philosophy of, okay, I've got a bit of cash. It might be in the business. It might be even personally. And I heard that you should save like three to six months into an account as your emergency fund. And I say to them, but um, I wouldn't really like be a great believer of that because you can have money available to you, completely accessible, but it can earn, you know, 4% a year. 
that we see the likes of these online German banks, for example, the likes of Trade Republic and Raisin. I actually set up Trade Republic account for myself yesterday because I like to be able to say to people, you know, this is how easy it is. Yeah. It took me less than five minutes. All I had to do was just have my passport beside me. Uh, I took a photograph of it and it was so simple. And I moved one euro across into that account just again to test it. And that euro is earning 4% a year. It's a personal bank account. It's not available for business businesses as such. But I'm now pleased myself that as and when I have monies, I can move it across. And then people talk to me about security because they're not familiar with Trade Republic. And the irony is that the security is actually better than it is in the Irish banks. The same with another German bank called Raisin. Uh, again, some people may have heard of it. Um, they provide you options within all of the European banks, Portuguese, Swedish. And it might sound a little bit left field. You might say, why would you put money into a Swedish bank? Because the rate of interest in that Swedish bank currently is 3.7%. The best interest you can get in Ireland is 2% with Bank of Ireland AIB. I know which I prefer. You know, and by the way, that Swedish bank has a treble A rating from the rating agencies, which is far superior to Bank of Ireland AIB. So it's just, again, it's a different way of yeah. thinking. And it's just getting yourself used to the fact that there are options out there. Well, I'm going to give you a gut reaction because this is funny because this is I find it's quite common. Trade Republic, a German bank, and you're getting a 4% return on the money, 4% interest growth on your money that you have in there compared to like what, what's, what's the average interest now in, in an Irish bank. For an instant access account in Ireland, it's still 0.5% at best. Yeah, like it's, it's nothing. It's less, less than yeah. inflation. So technically you're losing money. Absolutely. So you're losing money in an account in Ireland, 4% um, growth in a, a German bank, Trade Republic. Does it? There's an initial... Gut reaction that's purely born out of ignorance in me going, that seems a bit dodgy now, Nick. This is like send your money to a German bank. It, but it's simply because I don't understand it. So it, it, it's literally as simple as this is a, a normal current account. If I have 10,000 euros sitting in my bank account here, it should probably be sitting in a bank account that's earning money, unless I'm investing it. Or obviously, there's better uses than sitting in a bank account for your money. But if, if you're someone who just likes to have some money sitting there, it's better to be sitting in an account like this where you're, it's 4% growth on your money. Absolutely. And and the reality is that that money is instantly accessible. And, you know, whilst that rate of interest can vary, and it could go down a bit because we've seen, and banks are hilarious in that, they were very slow to increase deposit rates when interest rates were being hiked. Uh -huh. And as soon as it looked like interest rates have reached peak, which thankfully it looks like they have, and we, we understand that they're going to start falling, hopefully later on in the year, maybe not as quickly as we thought, um, deposit rates get sh shelved straight away. So even those accounts that I mentioned earlier in the German banks, the 3.7%, for example, in the Swedish bank, it was 4.1% okay. up until about two weeks ago. But it's still an opportunity for people. And yeah. it'll always be that differential. You know, when you talk about yes. doing the best you can. Like, why are you going to do, you know, the, the second best when the best is out there? And Trade Republic, and again, the key thing to, to know is that for me, and I've researched this myself, and I'm saying to you as a professional, I have no bias in recommending these accounts to my clients. It's something that I would do for myself. And it's more, again, as you said, it's that bridge of knowledge to, to recognize. I mean, for example, Revolut, when they first came into the Irish market, we were all a bit sort of skeptical. Yeah. Now, I think all of us probably have one. I have ones for my kids. Yeah, and yeah. We're, we're not afraid at all. And it's just because we got used to it. And yet, because we're not yet familiar. I mean... There's, a, there's another one, and I don't want to throw all these names at you, but like Richard Branson has invested in a company called Lightyear. You oh, may have I've heard actually heard of it. Yeah, you've yeah, heard yeah, of that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. But that was exactly the same. Because we've heard of Richard Branson, we probably feel a bit more comfortable. But the rate that they pay on that account is far less than Trade Republic or Raisin. And I think we all kind of probably guessed that German banks would be relatively secure. Um, and by the way, the Irish banks don't really want to see us anymore. We've, they've pushed us away, obviously, from, you know, we've seen so many of them close of late. So everything's gone online now. So it's just, again, getting your head around the fact that it is as simple as, as saying to yourself, okay, well, maybe I should suck it and see. Yeah. Like Nick sent one euro yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You know, would Dan do the same? And once you get familiar with these things, and, I, and by the way, I didn't send the euro because I'm afraid of losing money. I sent the euro just to test the process. Test the process. You know, and like that, I've done it with Bitcoin and I've done it with that. We won't get into cryptos today. <laughs> it's not a good financial plan for most of us, but it's about knowing like what the, the process is and then are we in a position to take advantage of it. But for most people out there, for, for business owners that are, you know, working hard in their business, 
make sure your money works just as hard as you do. Yeah. That's what I'd say. And just, just, to, just to round up that little point about the, the German bank, potential downsides, obviously the German economy crashes or something, or the banks, there's an issue with the banks. Or it's the, regulated by the EU, Dan. So it's actually, again, more secure. People talk about, you know, okay, the risk, and we feel happier if the money's in AIB. And I say to them, but that's the Irish government guarantee scheme. And as bad as things were in 2008, 2009, mm. and if people are as old as I am, um, they'll remember though that, that period. The Irish banks didn't default. None of the banks did apart from one bank, which was a separate bank, my, my country of uh, origin, um, and they defaulted their deposits. No other bank in the world did. So why are we so fearful? Like, why is there this worry? It's the unknown, I suppose. It's, it's you, can't, you can't walk down the road here, yeah. local trade union bank account and go in and see yeah. Mary and talk about your money. But the yeah. world, as you said, the world is different now. No, I, the world I, is completely different. last time I was in a bank. Yeah. Online, everything is online. Um, but that's su super interesting. Um, tax is something we've dipped into multiple times. I think to, to touch lightly on tax as a business owner, it's probably... I don't want to over or understate the importance of understanding because again, I'm, I was allergic to, to I thought, I don't want to know about that. Just, yeah, whatever. The government will take whatever they need and I'll be left with the rest. But as you have quite rightly pointed out, understanding how the system works empowers you to make better long-term decisions. And look, we all want to pay less tax, not because we don't want to contribute to the greater society. It's not what it's about because that's the pushback. Oh, you don't want to pay your tax. It's not that I don't want to pay my tax. I want to be tax efficient. I believe in paying tax. But I also believe that ignorance will lead you to overpaying or paying more than you necessarily need to through your business or personally as well. But from a business perspective, you probably are very strong on people understanding how to be more tax efficient when it comes to running the, the running of the business. Because again, this is one of those things. It doesn't matter how good you are necessarily at doing the thing or earning the money. That tax thing is another potentially the biggest gigantic hole in that bucket if you don't understand how it works. Not to try and, as I said, beat the system, but to try and be efficient. And it, it's, you're right, Dan, and whilst, you know, obviously anyone that's set up a company will have engaged with an accountant. Now, again, in some cases, there's very little conversation around the the strategy of the business. You know, it's more a case of, you know, okay, you've done this much in sales, this is what you've spent, and this is the profit you've made, and this is the tax you pay. That's generally pretty much it. for most people. Uh, certainly at the start, you know, before they get kind of more ingrained in, in okay, how can they do things better? Yeah. Um, but the, the, the main thing, again, in terms of tax is just to understand, and it's it really is as simple as saying, if it's Dan or Nick, the business that they've set up, essentially for the trading of that business, so whatever you're doing, so for, for Alpha Wealth, it's financial services, it's the providing of advice in those product areas that we've, we've touched on, um, any profit that's made by the business suffers a 12.5% tax rate. It's, very, it's a low tax rate, as we all know. This is Irish, Irish corporation Irish tax corporation that everybody hears about, yeah. And you might say, well, why is that such a bad thing? To my mind, though, again, I said earlier about, you know, tax for smaller companies, I believe, in the large part, is unnecessary in that you can avoid that quite simply by just nudging that pension payment up or down to suit your cloth, really. Um in terms of what you require from drawing from the business. And of course, all of us want to pay ourselves six figures and feel better about life and be able to afford all the luxuries that we want. But the reality is that that's not really why we do it. We do it because we have to make ends meet. So if you can maybe do it sort of back to front and say, okay, if I can make sure that on my personal side, my personal hat, I'm not overspending. I could, you know, comfortably live off you know, 40 grand a year, 50,000 a year, whatever the figure is for you. And it will vary. There's so many different pure permeables. I have four children in a blended family. I have two kids in secondary school, in fee paying secondary schools. Wasn't something I had anticipated. So you can imagine that, you know, there's costs that you, you bear. And obviously then if you can try and plan for the future, and this is the other thing, it's about starting early. You know, if you can start to build up these little pots, whether it be in a pension scheme, whether it be in a savings plan, it's when you need, you know, access to these funds that they can benefit you. Um, so not to deviate, but there's a lot of little kind of, again, nuggets of, even for most parents out there, you know, whenever I see a parent, I say to them, well, okay, one of the things that would be remiss of me not to mention is, are you doing anything in terms of like providing for the children in the future? And they're like, okay, well, what do you mean? Well, generally most of us look at third level education. You know, we know that there's a, a cost. Um, 
And you can read these books or things online saying, oh, you need about thirty to 40,000 a year, um, sorry, per child to get them through third level. And they're probably not totally inaccurate. I just don't know how realistic they are for most of us because if you have, you know, a few children and if Say you... those figures again, Nick. They, they, they estimate, Dan, and this is conservative, by the way, that you need about thirty to 40,000 for each child, roughly about 10,000 a year to help kids through college. Obviously, they're allowing for the cost of university, which for my son down in Cork in UCC, it's about 4,000 a year. There was a bit of a, a, a reduction this year. Um, if obviously they're living outside of the home. And again, this is where the figure can vary hugely. You know, if your child is living at, at home with you, it's going to be much less expensive mm -hmm. if they have to go and stay in somewhere in Dublin, let's say, where, you know, it's going to be a much bigger cost. And you could argue it would be more than the 10,000 on average. But what, what I say to parents is it's not something to be concerned with. It's just to be aware of. And again, what can you do to mitigate? So I say to them, if you can afford to put the child allowance away from an early age, that's going to generate that 40,000 for that child. Now, you might say, oh, yeah, Nick, but that's that's really holistic. Like, I mean, um, maybe what if you, you need that money? And I'd say, well, yeah, that's acceptable. You know, I totally understand. I've spent some of my kids' education money. Absolutely. And the plan was always to try and replenish that when mm. I could afford to. Like, again, you get, you, I see clients who are, they're, they're facing kind of, you know, significant debt because of a mortgage that's cost them more. They've had to take out a loan, maybe for a car. And yet they're paying into this child account, it's earning little or no interest for them. And I say that it's not really the most efficient thing you can do. You know, you have to deal with and tackle the problem. And then you can work on, you know, solving that problem in the future and it's again it's a different way of thinking it's just changing a sort of slight mindset to the fact that do the best you can you know and debt, debt is something that all of us have to get comfortable with i think it's sort of almost like a dirty word and mm -hmm. i say to people but you need to sort of be mindful of the fact that I, I use this kind of phrase i think i mentioned it on the last podcast you know of the snowball effect yeah so how what's the best thing you can do if you have debt you know and We've all had different forms, of the, or we may have had different forms. Your mortgage tends to be obviously the biggest one. It's the one that you're not really going to be paying off in the short term unless you win the lotto, let's say. Um, and then sometimes we kind of have a credit card. That's the really nasty one where, you know, you use it and then you creep into the fact that you don't repay it every month. I, I, some people who repay it every month religiously, I'm kind of okay with it. I'm not really okay with it, but I, I'd let it kind of slide a small bit. Um, and you want to think, why are you so fixated about it? Like there are people I know that some of my friends have credit cards, like, why is it such a big problem? And I say to them, it's because of the cost of debt. It's all about, you know, the interest the cost. Interest. Um, and if you can get your head around that and say to them, like I often ask people who have a mortgage, we ask like about 20 questions before we meet anybody. And I kind of insist that they fill it in. And it's not because I'm being difficult or I want to do the job before they, they come into me. It's just, it helps me start to sort of plan this kind of balance of, okay, what's important to them? What do I need to focus on? And I ask them like, what's the interest on your mortgage? And most people have a rough idea, but it, they don't tell me to the exact number. And they say, why are you so particular? Like, well, why does it matter if it's 2.5 versus 3.5%? Oh, yeah. Based on the numbers, it Based definitely on, matters. It, it really matters. But more importantly, it's about what can you do. So yeah. for most mortgage customers, you know, or holders that I speak to, and by the way, we don't provide mortgages. We, we just give the advice. I think it's really important, again, to a certain degree that you have that level of independence. And I say to them, well, okay, but what can you do at this point in time? If you're on a tracker, for example, which was so attractive for so many years, you're paying over 5% oh. now for your mortgage. doesn't mean you have to get off the tracker. And again, there's pros and cons but it's knowing what your option might be. So is it that you speak to the bank about fixing now, particularly if you can avail of a, a lower rate and that gives you that sort of comfort blanket? Or let's say if you know, you're know you in a position where you can get a green mortgage, which is a, where you have a, a slightly more energy efficient home. Um, or if you have the funds, can you tackle that problem earlier on? So if you've built up a bit of cash, one of the advantages of a track or a variable rate mortgage is you can pay it off early. It's funny, I came across a client um, during a week where, or last week I should say, where they um, they had some money in the bank. They built up just a bit of cash and they were selling shares in the company that worked with. They built up a lot of shares in their company, which is another issue, which again, sometimes is a legacy problem for people who may have accumulated shares. Um, 
And I say to them, but, you know, you've now got a, a mortgage that's costing you, you know, 5%. Would you not try and like just pay down some of that mortgage? And they were on a fixed rate, interestingly, a fixed rate mortgage. And they said, oh yeah, but our fixed rate doesn't come to expiry for two more years. I said to them, would you just do me one thing today and just contact your bank and tell them that you want to give them back 30,000, this 50,000 they had accumulated. And lo and behold, they contacted the bank and the bank were only too happy to accept it with no penalty. And that okay. was a key thing. And it was great in terms of just, again, it gave them, you talked earlier, Dan, about empowering them. And that they felt a lot more comfortable about the fact that it was just helping them because they, they were sort of averse to debt, really. And some people are more so. You know, it does empower you, particularly if you can pay off loans. And this snowball I talk about is deal with the smallest loan you have first, tackle it head on, and then you go on to the next one. And then by that time, um, typically you should only be left with your mortgage as your outstanding loan. That's yeah. what we try and help people with. You spoke last time, you used the example of a car loan as well and people trying to invest in different things while having this monstrous car loan yeah. with huge interest rates and stuff on it as well. So That's to, right, absolutely. Yeah. But like, again, back to your, your main point here is to, to generate an awareness, to have some sort of practice where you reflect on this, whether it's with an advisor or your accountant or your partner, whatever it is, just some, something that allows you to step back even if it's once a year, and go, okay, well, this is where we are. This is how things have changed. This is what everything looks like right now. And this is the direction we want to go. Are we still on point? Yeah. Are we not? Can we make a small adjustment? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the time, this conversation sounds like a tighten the belt kind of conversation. Like, okay, well, we're going to have to cut back in all these different areas now and start saving an extra X amount per month and stuff like that. And it's not necessarily the case. And it's why I like the word efficiency a lot when it comes to all these conversations. We spoke a lot about business owners. We just spoke about homeowners. It's more about being more efficient. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to completely decimate your lifestyle. Because I, I do think that's why a lot of people fall into the the the, the credit card trap and the, the, the P, PCP trap and all this kind of stuff. Because I don't want my lifestyle to be completely different. And yeah, in some cases, maybe we'll have to pull back a little bit in certain luxury expenses. But in a lot of cases, we're leaving so much on the table by just not understanding and I'm including myself in this, by the way, I'm not, I'm not professing to be a good practitioner of, of these uh, these rules, but we are leaving so much on the table. And particularly one of the biggest issues I've seen with all of the this financial planning stuff is it is one of the biggest drivers of stress in people. It's such a stressful thing to feel under financial pressure. Absolutely. And the, the other thing, Dan, as well, you're right. If anything, I, I'm saying to people, you know, it's about finding the balance, but I don't want people to to have to feel that they have to make sacrifices. And again, I put myself in that category. You know, it's funny. I spoke to my wife. Um, we were talking about these sort of, um, you know, I suppose our plans and our, our hopes. You know, we want to enjoy things in life as well. Um, you know, I was at a funeral recently and it does, it helps you reset and just think about, puts perspective in, you know, what is life about? And again, without sounding morbid. Um, and what I'm saying to them is that, you know, live the lifestyle that you feel that you want and deserve. If you live within your means, there's no issue with that. You know, I spend more than, you know, I feel generally I would be comfortable with, you know, four children. Um, you know, you, you kind of, you get to points where, you know, your kids are, you know, and we've seen the whole kind of, as kids get older, and I know, Dan, you've got like a couple of smallies that, you know, that it costs money. And, and yet, yet talking to them in terms of planning their finances and, you know, your kids are like screaming at you because they want to go away on a, a lovely holiday. And you do Balenciaga trainers and exactly. the latest iPhone. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And everyone's walking around with these kind of North Face jackets <laughs> on and so on. Yeah, It's just that generation. And you just have to sort of understand that that's where we are. But as long as you live within your means and, and one of the advantages of business owners is, again, you have the ability to adapt to that. You can turn it up. I'm not against paying tax. I'm just, as you said, Dan, I'm against paying tax inefficiently. Yeah. Um, company cars, I mean, that's a topic, again, for, for business owners. You know, do you buy a company car yeah. um, or do you not? And um, <sighs> the the interesting thing is I have a company car, so I'm not going to say to people, you shouldn't have one. It's just an understanding of what the benefit and kind implications are. Mm. And they've changed of late. It's become more expensive to have a company car. Um and whether or not it makes sense for you, this is going back to this one doesn't fit all, you know, solution. So like, I drive a nice car. I couldn't afford it personally. And I understand the implications of me. It impacts obviously on my take on pay because of the fact that I have to pay benefit in kind. If you have a commercial vehicle and there's some good commercial vehicles, my, my, one of my best friends has a similar car to mine, but it's a two door and okay. it suits his requirements. And it's totally bona fide for 
you know, it's BIK free. And then there's a the whole movement towards electric vehicles. And, you know, again, there's pros and cons. I personally couldn't drive an electric vehicle. I have a hybrid. Um, another story, but I'm just, I, I, I'm just very impatient. <laughs> <laughs> Probably why I'm a business owner. But um, so it just depends on what works for you. But it's, it's, it's knowing, again, what are the implications of that? It's not just a case of, should I buy a company car? It's why do you want to? Can you afford to buy it yourself personally? Because yeah. if you can, it generally would be better in that instance. You know, again, it's not a case of just, okay, I have a company, so I have a company car. Yeah. It's what benefits you. If you can avoid benefit in kind, again, totally legitimately, you know, I couldn't pass that because I would have to leave my company car at the office. You know, that's one of the conditions of that. And that wasn't going to work for me. But yeah. in some instances, you know, particularly if you're working in your home is your office, that may well be possible. So it's worth exploring further. For yeah, sure. it's it's funny. This is a bit, a little, a little, we'll, we'll finish on this segment here, but there's a little bugbear of mine <laughs> talking to people about um, the benefits from your company and BIK. I, I looked into this over the last couple of years as well. It turned out to be completely inefficient for me to have a company car. But uh, when people look at business owners and this whole idea of expensing everything, you get your company car and you expense your phone, you expense your laptop. And you're like, sure, the company's paying for that. You're not even paying for that. And I'd just like to clarify, for business owners and non-business owners, that the company will potentially buy something for use in the company. It's a, com it's a company investment. And sometimes the company's in, uh, um, goals and your goals overlap. So there are certain things that you can, like, for example, I have a company phone because I do all my business through my company phone. But I also answer phone calls on my company phone sometimes. So it, there, there's areas there where it, it overlaps, but it's not something that's free because you buy it with your company because it's an expense for the company. And then also this idea of a company car, benefit in kind was something that completely shocked me when I found out what it was. This idea that, yes, the company can buy the car, but there is an associated cost as well for you because you're benefiting from driving this car, benefit in kind. So you still end up having to contribute. So it's, it's a, again, just this is why I'm saying it's not about beating the system. None of this beats the system. Expenses incurred by your company are designed to help you grow your company. That's the whole idea behind a company expense. It's not an excuse to fund your lifestyle and your holidays and your trips away and your new technology and a nice car because there are systems in place to ensure that you follow the rules. Absolutely, Dan. And like, just, I suppose, to finish off on this segment, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention about health insurance. And I suppose one of the things I'd say to all business owners out there is that health insurance is a benefit and kind expense. It doesn't really benefit you by getting the company to pay for it. You could but you're just deferring the liability. So the key thing though for all business owners is, uh, especially if you've gone from a situation where you did have, say, company health insurance, so it wasn't something that you were particularly kind of in tune with, it can be a very, very big expense uh, personally for, for a business owner because you could be carrying the cost of health insurance for yourself, possibly for your partner, and obviously if you've got dependents. And particularly, uh, there's certain times in the year, generally the start of the year, and towards the, the, the latter end of the year where there's a lot of renewals that come up. You know, it's interesting. There was a couple of articles over the weekend around, um, you know, make sure that you shop around. And it's really difficult because there's over 400 health insurance plans in Ireland, only three providers, over 400, um, and only three providers. So there's not a huge amount of like competition between, you know, different providers. There's 11 life insurance companies out there, obviously, you know, competing but only three health insurance providers. And obviously most of us know the likes of VHI, who were the kind of the old, uh, you know, uh, company that recently now we have Layer and obviously Irish Life Health. It's not about the provider, it's about the plan that you're on. And again, getting proper advice can save thousands and thousands of euros on a like-for-like -like basis. I say to people, look, are you availing of online discounts? Are you getting, if you have more than one child, the other children for free? Because if you're not, they're two really easy fixes that you should look to take advantage of. A lot of clients I come across, you know, they're paying uh, for cover that they don't require. You know, for example, the most important things really for health insurance are inpatient cover, which is if you go into hospital overnight, and then outpatient, which is, you know, if you want to claim back for things like GP, physio, and so on. If you have outpatient benefits, it adds 400 to 1,000 euros to the cost of your policy. And for some people, they won't benefit from it because... You know, I come across some males, I don't want to be sexist, uh -huh. but they don't go to the GP unless they're like on death's door kind of yeah. thing. And they never they never take advantage of the op option. Now that could change in the future. But again, it's like that. It's about checking in once a year. And yeah. that's an important one 
because that's a, an annual sort of review process. Yeah. Mortgage protection, for example, these people who, anyone who's taken out a mortgage, they have to take out life insurance to protect the loan that the bank provides them. It's the only policy that any business owner has, should pay for themselves. Everything else should be the company, in my opinion. Um, a lot of us are paying way over what we should be. And this goes back to the efficiencies, you know, like, can you get the premium down to under 25 euros a month? That's the the ready reckoning I say to everyone. So if you said, Nick, okay, how do I know if I'm paying too much or too little? My initial question would be, are you pay more than 25 euros a month? You might say, Nick, sure, that could be totally different for people. What if I'm in my 50s versus my 30s? It's a generalization, but it's one that generally carries. I don't believe that anyone should really, unless you're smoking heavily, um, and look, we've all moved, hopefully, a little bit away from that. And look, for those... Vaping that, as well. Vaping Trying as well, vaping I should say, too. yeah. yeah. Um, but the fact is that, you know, it's a, a product that is totally oversold. And that's what kind of slightly errs me because that's generally speaking, like advisors play, preying on fear, particularly, you know, historically, when you're going in for a mortgage, you're going to sign any document really to get out. And if the bank have given you the loan, yeah. you feel a little bit kind of uh, obligated, obligated to, to take out the protection. Um, just on that, I spoke earlier about the, the main takeaways, really. The financial budgeter is key. It really is. And I can't keep emphasizing that, how important it is. The other thing I'd say, as part of this roadmap, and for any you know individual out there, whether you're a business owner or not, it's the same principle. I talk about um, planning out, but like, I refer to them as projections. So if you said, Nick, what do you mean by that? I talk about these kind of magic numbers. So, you know, we talk about retiring. Okay. And again, I, I use that phrase like notionally. I, I don't try and retire people at 60 or earlier than that. I try and get them to become financially independent and then choose. My dad worked till he was 90. I have no notion to do so. But whether I retire at 63 or not, and I have a nine-year-old at home, which is why it's 63 for me, I want to become financially independent. I'm determined to. And that's why I do this uh, plan every year to see what has changed my life. And a lot has changed. All of us, you know, particularly the business owners, massive change. Most of us didn't anticipate. I started life in the UK. Anyone who's worked in the UK, by the way, for three years or more can and should take advantage of buying more UK state pension years. Massive opportunity. But most of us probably wouldn't even realize. And if that's something that um, obviously... Um, you may qualify for, um, definitely speak to me because it's a massive area for, for all of us. You know, it's just money for jam as I talk. But going back to these projections, if I, I said earlier about, you know, saving for your kids' futures, saving for your financial independence, what does that look like? It has to be put down, you know, in a way that you can visualize. There's no point in me saying, oh, Dan, you know, you should be paying more into a pension and you understand that it's tax efficient. It's not really enough. It's not going to be compelling enough to make you act. Yeah. But if I said, Dan, let me show you that by you put in this money every month from the company, and I prefer it to be done monthly, by the way, not just, oh, I've got a tax problem, Nick, can you help me? I say to them, but set your stall out. If you're earning money every month, it would be easier and better, in my opinion, to utilize that money as you earn it. Otherwise, you just get to the end of the year, and even though the problem exists, you can't deal with it. Yeah. You know, Reducing tax, by the way, costs money. And it may surprise you to hear that. And you say, oh, but the whole point of paying less tax is that it costs me less money. But I say, the problem is you need money to reduce your tax bill. It's slightly, again, a bit of a paradox if you think about it. If you say, well, what do you mean, Nick? Well, you can pay less tax by putting more into your pension. But putting more into your pension costs money, of course. But you benefit hugely, as we've discussed, in the end game. It's investing in yourself as opposed investing to yourself, the money exactly, going out the door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you need to sort of know and see what it looks like. So if I said to, and we do this for every client that we meet, we show them a projection based on where they are now and what they're likely to get to based on their current trajectory. And then by making those fine tunes, where they're going to end up. Yeah. Pensions, for example, again, as complex as the industry makes it, and hopefully, you know, we spelt out that it's just a long-term savings plan. What should it look like at 60 for most people as a rule of thumb? And I say, well, typically you need 400,000 euros in a private pension. I honestly believe that. If you say, well, how can you be so specific? Like why 400,000? Um, just again, very briefly, if Nick or Dan reached the age of 60 and had 400,000 in a pension scheme, 
independently of the state pension, which we spoke about, currently payable from age 66, about 13,500 a year. You may have had other assets, hopefully accumulated, maybe, you know, investments, maybe, you know, you own your own home. Um, that would afford you a quarter of that pension scheme tax-free as a minimum. So that's 100,000 euros. And I'm going to refer to today's money, you know, in, in yeah. now value. So you've got 100,000 euros sitting in your bank account that you haven't paid a cent of tax on. And of the 300,000 that remains, that would afford you about 25,000 a year as an income. Now, if you're earning 100,000 a year at the moment, which again, for most business owners, I wouldn't suggest would be ideal. You know, we try and keep our income low as a business owner and afford ourselves the benefits and other things. Um, but that plus the state pension, plus that 100,000 that you're going to sort of drip feed into your account because you don't pay tax on it. So that would obviously suit. Yeah. I think that should give you a reasonable chance at having the ability to work a lot less or not have to work at all. Now, again, it's a bit of a generalization. It depends on, you know, do you have a partner? Are they in a similar situation? Do they have a pension? Do they not? And are you on the hook for, you know, the family, as I call it? But you can understand that, you know, there's no point me saying to somebody who's putting 100 quid a month into their pension scheme at age 50 that it's going to necessarily provide the lifestyle that they want. Yeah. And it's not about guilting them or anything. It's just about showing them awareness awareness, and, and then what can they do then to benefit themselves. And there are those that will exceed that, you know, and that's the next step then is, okay, Nick, what's the next level to try and achieve? And then we talk about sweet spot. So the next stage is 800,000 in the pension. And again, we're not getting into too much detail. We explain why that, that would be a useful point. And he said, Nick, okay, what if you do really well? You mentioned earlier about you can pay as much money from your company into a pension scheme. So there are cash rich businesses out there that have done extremely well, you know, in the past. And they have built up reserves in their business. And just to mention and to finish on th this topic, that 2.15 million is the maximum pension scheme that you can get in Ireland. And that may seem like a large figure, particularly for anyone who's sort of starting out on their financial journey. Um, but believe it or not, there are certainly quite a number of people that over the years, with proper financial planning, will get to that figure. You say, okay, Nick, what's the significance of that? Um, the fact is that it's an understanding. Like we talk about, you know, the minimum and maximum. I show people what the best you can do is. And then obviously you then say, okay, well, look, I understand where I am on that sort of scale. You know, that scale, exactly. So um, it's, yeah. you know, again, it's interesting. And, and lots of things change in life. You know, as I say, you've just got to go through those different kind of hurdles yeah. uh, and challenges and you mentioned earlier about efficiency, Dan. I think that's a really good word to use. Yeah, Nick, as, as always, so much usable information in there. This is one of those episodes where I wanted to keep it relatively compact so we, people could listen back and take the bits that they need out of it. What I'm taking from this, number one, auto enrollment is coming. There's one of those big decisions that we have to make or will have made for us. And that's not a, that's, it doesn't happen very regularly, but definitely any business owners listening to this right now, start looking into your options regarding pensions. Now that we understand, thanks to Nick, what a pension is, how it can benefit us and all the different ways we can leverage that. Definitely that for me, the biggest takeaway here is it's coming September this year. September looks like, yeah. September this year. And obviously as soon as possible, start looking into what decisions can you make within your own business. And um, secondly, that general idea of efficiency within your business and how this entity can do more for you and should do more for you than simply paying your salary and paying your wage. It's a different thing. It's a different consideration if you are a PAYE employee. We spoke about that a lot in our last podcast, but if you are a business owner, there is a different strategy required. But the principles are the same. Generate awareness, have some sort of system for doing a review or an assessment, one of these online budget calculators, speaking to a financial advisor, but generate an understanding of how your situation looks, where you want to go, and then the opportunities available to you on that pathway. Absolutely. Um, and this, we actually never said what fire was. Do you, want to, do you want to say what fire is? Yeah, so it's like, basically it's a movement and it's gathering pace and there's different, you know, requirements for it. But it's like, um, you know, essentially it's like retire early. So it's like um, financial, financial independence, independence retire, retire early. early. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, and it's, in essence, what we've been discussing around the fact that it's that awareness piece, it's focusing really on the future now. Yeah. And that's that's the key thing. Um, but definitely the the main takeaways, as you said, Dan, you've kind of 
yeah. you've, you've hit uh, on the head. The, the most important thing I, I just reiterate is, you know, get advice. It's really, really important, I think, particularly for business owners. You're good at what you do and it's about allowing, you know, other people to kind of help you along the way in the journey. And that's what I say, like, it's great to have people in your corner. Yeah. You've got your accountant generally, if you've set up a company and then it's about who else, you know, I think it's important, you know, make sure you've got a will made. It's interesting, like I'm seeing more around the fact that particularly in the changing world that we find ourselves, you know, a lot of, um, you know, different types of situations now where people are getting sort of, you know, divorced, remarried, so on and so forth. It's just important to know, okay, what are the implications of, you know, the event of, um, and it's not difficult, you know, it really isn't. And the, the, the most important thing is that most people perceive as other hassle in this. Um, getting uh, financial advice generally shouldn't cost you much at all. You know, typically the, the, the fee that Alpha Wealth would normally charge is no more than 200 euros. Um, anyone that listens to the podcast, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we will reduce that fee down to 99 euros. That's very kind. Uh, you. Which, you know, again, it's something that we, we've offered in the past. Uh, just make sure that you reach out. Um, my email address is very similar. It's just nick at alphawealth.e. I'm sure you can get uh, a hold of us through Alpha Wealth. Uh, but just make aware of the fact that it was through the the, um, the podcast. And again, we're more than happy to read that. And that's a once-off fee, by the way. It's There's no further fees or charges for those ongoing reviews. Mm. It's really important to, to recognize that. Just a bit of feedback on that. I've had many people since our last podcast together avail of that. And the, the feedback is brilliant. Because it, again, it's more about this awakening people have when they speak to someone like yourself, where they realize the decisions they have and that their situation is not what they thought it was. There are many, many options, and you're obviously able to help and guide them on that. So, and I appreciate that, that that kind gesture as well. So, people, if you're interested, please do take advantage of this. It's a conversation that could change the trajectory of your business, of your life, and I'm not overstating that. I don't think. But uh, Nick, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks very much, Dan. It's a pleasure. Thanks again. We'll see you in the next one. Great, absolutely. Thanks, Dan. <laughs>